Thanks, Kayla. Everybody, thanks for thanks for being here. We're gonna do um, make room for room board review today. So sort of a whirlwind tour of rheumatology. We're gonna talk about arthritis, myositis, connective tissue diseases, and also um, if we have time, a few things that they love to ask on the boards. So by the end of this lecture, internal medicine residents will be able to discuss acute and chronic inflammatory arthritis and initiate treatment manage osteoarthritis with evidence-based treatments, recognize physical features and lab patterns associated with connective tissue disease, and discuss initial treatment options, recognize the presentation of vasculitis according to the size of vessel involvement, and be able to recognize and treat common musculoskeletal issues that are commonly seen in primary care. So, um, and sprinkled throughout the presentation, um, we have some cases for you guys to go through, and Javel is nice enough to, to enter those as Zoom polls. So we'll be popping those up throughout the presentation. So a 45-year-old male comes to clinic with a two-day history of progressively severe right knee swelling. He's unable to walk on it, unable to range it. It's, it's hot, it's red, tender. He has a history of psoriasis, which is poorly controlled, no recent trauma reported. He may have had a low-grade fever, no similar episodes. He's on lisinopril, hydrochlorothiazide, drinks two beers a day. His temperature is 99 degrees Fahrenheit. He has psoriatic plaques on his scalp, his trunk. He has no toe fi. His right knee, um, he has a moderate size diffusion. He holds it at 45 degrees in flexion, resists any movement at all, and it's warm and tender to touch. So what do you want to do next? Do you want to request a CBC, serum uric acid? Do you want to x-ray his knee? Or do you want to aspirate some fluid? Nice. <laughs> okay, nice. All right. Um, we're going to have to do uh, better with our uh, questions here and make them a little bit more confusing. So yes, um, I would like to do, I'd like to do, you know, all of these things, but I think the thing that I would do first when I have this patient in clinic is try to get some fluid out of the knee so we can try to figure out what exactly is happening here. And when I take fluid from that knee, I'm going to send it, I'm going to look at the fluid and I'm also going to send it for a uh, cell, cell, cell count and differential culture and also crystal exam. So you did get that CBC. He's got a leukocytosis. His CRP is way high. It's hundred. He's got 85,000 cells in his synovial fluid. The culture grows MRSA, uh, MR, ugh, MRSA and um, he's diagnosed with sept septic arthritis. So I don't know if any of you uh, saw um, the presentation I gave back in September about the BBC joint. So BBC joint is an acronym that we like to use um, for that joint that is hot. It is so painful. The patient does not want to move it. And they hold it in 45 degrees flexion because that is the angle that allows for that um, joint capsule to be the most distended. So it's the most comfortable position. They resist movement. They don't want you to move it. And the BBC joint, bugs, blood, and crystals can be caused by bacteria, um, blood in the joint, or crystals, as in uh, gout or, or, or um, CBD arthropathy or pseudogout. So take a look at these syringes. So over here in panel A, this is normal synovial fluid and it's not inflammatory. I mean, there's not a lot of cells in this fluid. And the reason that I know that is because when I look at this syringe, I can see the lines on the other side of the syringe. And that tells me that there are not a lot of cells. Um, in this syringe though, if you um, were trying to look at the other side, you wouldn't be able to see it. And that tells me that, that this is an inflammatory effusion that we've aspirated from this knee. And then in panel C, this is just, this is just pus from an infected knee or affected joint. 
the cell count can can help you somewhat in figuring out is this um, inflammatory, uh, you know, potentially help you figuring out if it's infectious. It can certainly help you figure out if it's non-inflammatory. So non-inflammatory joint, again, that fluid is transparent. You can see the other side. There's less than 2,000 cells in that fluid. If the fluid is inflammatory, um, still somewhat translucent, but you can't see the other side, generally less than 75,000 white cells, although certainly we've had patients that have gout that have more than 75,000 white cells. Um, and then often in a septic joint, that fluid is opaque. And um, there's often more than 75,000 cells, but not always, it's sort of a general guideline, but certainly um, there are cases where that um, is not the case. So a few key points about septic arthritis. So these patients, um, they, uh, particularly if they have a bacterial infection with staph or strep, which are the most common, they will have fever, they will have leukocytosis, they will have that, that BBC joint, that joint that is so painful that they're not going to want you to move it. Um, although in patients who are immunosuppressed, their degree of discomfort may be, may be blunted. Some risk factors include underlying joint disease, so abnormal joints, like in a patient with rheumatoid arthritis, also diabetes, IV drug use, cirrhosis, CKD, patients that are immunosuppressed, or those that have skin disease, including psoriasis. Um, joint distribution tends to, tends to affect large joints much more than small joints. Small joints of um, the hands and feet could be affected, for instance, in someone with rheumatoid arthritis, but not, not commonly in other patients. Again, usually staph and strep, um, though um, GNRs can cause septic arthritis, you can see mycobacteria, including tuberculosis, and then also gonococcal disease. Um, and we'll look at a few pictures of that. Um, so that uh, there's that rule, you know, often greater than 75,000 um, cells but not everyone follows, follows that rule. Some could be as low as 25,000. Regarding treatment, these patients get antibiotics um, usually for several weeks, and we want to involve our orthopedic colleagues as well. So um, regarding out outcomes, mortality is increased in polyarticular disease and with some of these other risk factors like age, diabetes, um, in patients with IV drug use, um, one thing to know is that they frequently can have involvement of the, um, the midline fibrous uh, joints in the chest, which is an un unusual site for people to get um, septic arthritis otherwise. Uh, brucella is a, a, a bug that can cause septic arthritis frequently in the sacroiliac joint. Um, and this is uh, in, in those that are have some association with livestock or um, are consuming unpasteurized dairy products. Patients with hemochromatosis are affected by iron loving organisms, such as uh, Yersinia, Shigella, Vibrio, um, Listeria, and mycobacteria is, uh, tends to be quite uh, indolent. So more slow growing, there's this idea that a septic joint with mycobacteria like TB can have what's called cold inflammation. It's not that super hot, um, inflamed, acutely um, painful joint. It's more of like a slow thing that's happening over time. Um, and uh, it can also cause tenosynovitis, so inflammation around the tendons. Gonococcal arthritis is something that used to be quite common um, you know, 30 years ago, this was being seen a lot, but uh, for years there, we didn't see any cases. And then recently I saw two cases, one that was definitely confirmed. And then another that was sort of suspected. Um, and our, our ID colleagues have told us that perhaps the strains of, of um, gonorrhea that cause gonococcal or diffuse uh, disseminate gonococcal um, disease have been displaced by other strains, but now we're seeing it again. So maybe maybe we will be seeing this. So be, be on the lookout for this. Um, typically causes polyarticular disease, often causes tenosynovitis in addition to synovitis. And these patients 
um, they, they will often have up to five of these pustules that I'm going to show you on the next slide, but not, not more than five. That is the rule. They, and the, and the pustules kind of hide. You have to, you have to look for them. They're quite small. Um, and these, it's this bug in particular is difficult to isolate from synovial fluid. So if you suspect that your patient could have disseminated gonococcal disease, you want to test them for gonorrhea and you want to test every orifice. So swab every, every orifice um, for patients. And that is includes um, throat, um, penis, anus, what have you, every single orifice to try to isolate this bug. So here's a few images of so this patient. Um, is a patient that had a septic arthritis of the right wrist. And you can see here how the bones are kind of have this sort of um, overlying sort of gray, hazy appearance. This is related to destruction. And also the, the bones are, are much closer together compared to the other side. You can see the distinct joint lines on this side and you've kind of lost that on this side. So, so patients that have this kind of inflammatory insult to their joint, they um, develop secondary osteoarthritis with joint space narrowing and then this kind of periarticular osteopenia um, that you can see here. This is a patient um, also with a destructed wrist from septic arthritis. This patient had TB arthritis and it's common to have this draining sinus tract to the skin in patients that have TB or, or fungal arthritis. Uh, unfortunately, very de destructive here. And then this is a patient, this is that, that um, sort of classic GC pustule that you'll see in disseminated gonococcal arthritis. And again, you'll see perhaps up to five of these, but not more than that. And they hide, you have to look for them. So case two, 50 year old male with a recent diagnosis of gout returns for follow-up. He has had multiple attacks in the last few years. He has TOFI at both of his elbows. His initial uric acid was 8.7. He has a family history of gout. His serum creatinine was normal and his medications um, for mild hypertension include lisinopril. And he's also on niacin for high triglycerides. He was started on alpurinol two months ago and is currently on 300 milligrams a day um, and has had four additional attacks since then. So he tells you like this, I hate this medicine. I can't believe you gave it to me. It totally made me worse. I don't want to take it. And in this time that he's been on allopurinol, his uric acid has dropped to 7.2. So what do you want to do for this patient? Do you want to stop allopurinol and start probluxostat? Do you want to add colchicine one tab daily and continue his allopurinol? Do you want to stop allopurinol and start plagotoglase because he has TOFI? Or do you want to give him prednisone with an unclear endpoint? All right, so a little, little, little more diversity on this one. Okay, so the correct answer is to add colchicine. So we're going to talk a little bit about gout, and we're going to talk about why this patient should be on colchicine as prophylaxis to protect him from flares. So this is a photo of a patient with gout, and he has a flare in two joints. So he's got a flare here in the first NTP, which is that that's classic joint associated with with gout, um, Gardner's rule number 12, acute inflammatory arthritis in the first NTP is number one, gout, number two, gout, number three, gout. And then also he's got an inflamed ankle. And this is a beautiful example of gouty pseudocellulitis. So if you, if you saw this redness over the skin, the first thing you might think is, does this patient have cellulitis? But the difference between gouty pseudocellulitis and cellulitis is that it, it's, it's hard to take your marker, your skin um, drawing pen and draw a line around this because the erythema is, is sort of has this uh, kind of faded edge to it. So it's a pseudocellulitis rather than a, a true cellulitis. This one, this one is not as good of an example of that, but this is, <laughs> this is a good example. And then here we have these needle shaped monosodium urate crystals, um, which are parallel with the, um, with our, um, the, the polarizer. 
So a few key issues when it comes to gout. So gout is very common in men that are older than 40 years. And it is extremely rare in women before menopause. So if you see a woman that has acute, acutely inflamed joints and she has not gone through menopause, it's highly, highly, highly unlikely that it, that is gout. Um, there are a lot of medications that we use commonly that increase uric acid, including diuretics, niacin, hydrochlorothiazide is a huge culprit, um, cyclosporin and tacrolimus, and then also even low-dose aspirin. Um, there are a lot of foods that increase um, serum uric acid, including uh, red meat, shellfish, fish, um, beers, uh, hard liquors, high, um, high fructose corn syrup, and also diseases that increase uric acid. So leukemia, lymphoma, psoriasis, CKD, CHF. And then there are, are also, also people that perhaps related to genetics just tend to have a, a high uric acid production, in particular um, Pacific Islanders and uh, Filipino people. So, so normal serum uric acid is 6.8 or less. And this is something that's really con confusing because you might see in a lab somewhere that it says the normal cutoff is something like, um, I don't know, 7.2 or something like that. And, and um, that I imagine was, was based on, you know, some sort of survey of the population to figure out what's the, what's the, um, or is it, you know, normal and some standard deviation away from that is abnormal, but, um, but 6.8 is a really important number. And this number is important because when the concentration of uric acid is 6.8, that's when we form crystals in our body. And that's why um, rheumatologists will advocate for treat to target therapy. So treating your um, uric acid or, or titrating your uric acid lowering therapy so that the patient's uric acid is less than six, because in that case, the patient is unlikely to reach this threshold where they will form um, crystals. Um, so how do we diagnose gout? The gold, the gold standard is to demonstrate intracellular uric acid, acid crystals in synovial fluid. But you know, that may not be, you know, um, that may not be possible. Like say the patient comes to see you in clinic and you think that they have gout, but you're not able to take fluid from it, or maybe you're seeing the patient several weeks after they had this flare. So how do you figure out, does that patient have gout or not? And you can ask them a lot of questions. So when people have gout, almost every one of them, their initial presentation is monoarticular. And over time, it can become something that is oligoarticular or even polyarticular, but the initial presentation is almost always in a single joint, usually in a lower extremity joint, often in the first MTP. And that may not be the case for everybody, particularly young patients. And there's a lot of theories out there as to why, why does gout like the first MTP? And the theory that makes the most sense to me is that the first MTP is a very, very common site to have osteoarthritis. And we put all of our weight on that joint throughout the day. So you might have a little bit of fluid in that joint. And then during the night, that fluid is resorbed. And suddenly the concentration of uric acid in that joint is greater than 6.8. You can have a flare. And then there's also um, the idea that it's very far away from the body it tends to be a, a colder area and that contributes as well. Um, gout can also cause bursitis and tendonitis, particularly olecranon bursitis. Um, some patients have these sort of chronically swollen um, olecranon bursae related to gout. The patient um, should have hyperuricemia if you're suspecting that they have gout. And um, we have to be careful about when we, when we check the uric acid, some people might say, oh, don't, don't even check it during a flare, but I think it can sometimes still be helpful. It's just, as long as you realize that the uric acid can be falsely decreased by one to two points during an acute flare. And the reason for that is you are sampling blood from the serum that's circulating through the body, but the uric acid is in the tissues and in the joints wreaking havoc. And so you, that, that, value that you get from the serum may not be representative of the, the full body. Also, patients can have characteristic imaging results. So if, you're, if your patient tells you that they've had, um, you know, these acute flares in, in the foot or the ankle, you can obtain an x-ray and you may see findings that are characteristic of gout. 
Also, sometimes in, um, in rheumatology clinic, we will use ultrasound to look for something called a double contour sign, which has a very high specificity for gout. And what that is, is just layering of uric acid um, in the joints, kind of like an icing of uric acid. Also, the, uh, the joints that are affected may, may give you an idea about whether or not this is gout. So this is, um, this is what we call a, a homunculus. So these are all the joints in the, in the body and you see them in sort of this exaggerated fa fashion. And the larger the circle, that means the greater the predilection that um, gout has for that specific joint. So gout loves the first MTP. It also really loves the midfoot. Um, and so this is the, the midfoot right here and also the ankle. It loves the knee as does um, CPPD. Um, also likes the wrist and the elbow. And then also in, in patients usually that have um, more advanced gout, they can have uh, flares in the fingers as well. Also the spine. We have some patients with um, gout in the spine too. And that tends to be in patients that have sort of chronically uncontrolled tophosis gout. The um, symptoms of a gout flare it causes that intense pain, that BBC joint, the redness and the swelling, it develops rapidly within an hour. So if someone tells you like, this is something that's been creeping up, you know, over several, uh, several weeks, I've been having uh, pain here. That's not usually gout. It's that sort of rapid, I often wake up with it in the morning pain that um, accelerates to the most painful point generally within 24 hours and usually gets better in a couple of weeks, even without treatment. So I mentioned that um, patients usually start with that monoarticular flare. So this, when they have that monoarticular flare, they're sort of right here. They've likely had asymptomatic hyperuricemia for years before they had that monoarticular flare. And then if, if it's, um, or if this, if this person has the potential to go on to have sort of chronic gouty arthritis, they will have these intercritical periods punctuated by acute gouty arthritis flares. And then if they are untreated for many years, they will go on to have chronic gouty arthritis with TOFI. And these patients are the ones that have polyarticular flares. So many multiple joints affected at a time, and they also have this kind of chronic inflammatory state where they have more pain and stiffness in their joints um, that is not just that acute sort of um, acute flare, but it's more of a chronic condition at that point with more chronic symptoms. So these are examples of, of TOFI. You can see here, this is either a TOFIS or a, an um, olecranon uh, bursitis, hard to tell without touching it. Um, this is certainly a TOFIS here, this is an elbow. And then um, this is one spot where TOFI like to hide and that is on um, the ear. So we look carefully for any TOFI here. There's a theory that this is not um, as common anymore because of central heating and that it was more common when we didn't have central heating and that um, in the night people, uh, their ears were exposed to the cold. Um, I don't know how that, that theory holds up or with what Gigi thinks about that, but. Um, and this patient um, has multiple TOFI in the hands. Here's a, a TOFIS here. Um, a really just fat, fat toe, likely a lot of TOFI in there. And then this is a really neat technology called a dual energy CT that our radiologists are able to do um, at Harborview where they um, look for uric acid and they, this green stuff is all uric acid deposition in this patient's foot. So this test can be helpful, say if you're um, concerned about TOFI in an area where it's difficult to reach them. So like in the, in the spine, or if you have a patient where it's not quite clear as the scout or some other inflammatory arthritis, um, then a dual energy CT could potentially be helpful. So um, there are three stages of medical therapy um, with uh, treating patients with gout. And this goes back to our question that we were going over. That patient, he had had several attacks. I don't know whether they were treated or not, but he was initiated on chronic urate lowering therapy 
um, with allopurinol, but he was not given anything to protect him from flares. And this is very important. And when we start our patients on uric acid lowering therapy, they're actually at higher risk for flares in that initial period, usually for the first six months. And so we need to be giving them something to protect them until they get their uric acid to goal. And that medication is um, generally colchicine, but you could use you could use um, low dose uh, uh, NSAIDs or prednisone. So acute acute flares um, initiate treatment early because the earlier you initiate the treatment, the earlier it is to to treat that flare. So I will give patient, I will tell patients every patient has a flare plan and they have their medicine on hand because if they, as soon as they recognize a flare, I want them to be able to start their medicine right away because a flare that goes on and persists, you, you may have noticed like a patient comes in and they've been having this flare for say 10 days. It's a lot harder to, to, to um, often harder to treat something that has been persisting. Um, and um, also during the flare, it's very important to continue their uric acid lowering therapy if it's already been initiated. You could also use NSAIDs in patients with normal kidney function. You could use steroids in patients that don't have contraindications to that. You can use colchicine, but you must give it within 24 hours of the onset of the flare. A patient that comes to you in clinic three days after the onset of the flare, colchicine is not going to work. It only works when it's given within 24 hours of the flare onset. Also, um, we use a lot of anakenra at, at our institution for treatment of gout flares. And this is unfortunately not, um, not yet FDA approved, but I, I suspect it will be at some point. Um, it's very effective for treating gout. The American College of Rheumatology, they have come out with several helpful guidelines in recent years. And one of those is um, their 2020 gout guidelines. So they gave us some, some pretty clear recommendations for when patients should be started on uric acid lowering therapy. They, they recommend against treating asymptomatic hyperuricemia, but um, they do recommend treating patients that have TOFI, patients that have radiographic damage from gout, and in patients that have two or more attacks per year. They also conditionally recommend treating gout flares or treating, giving uric acid lowering therapy in patients that have had at least one gout flare plus CKD stage three or worse have a high uric acid because these patients have a, a high positive predictive value of going on to have more flares or if they have urolithiasis. First line therapy for, for gout um, includes the, the xanthine oxidase inhibitors, um, allopurinol, which is our sort of uh, tried and true medicine for gout. It works, it works really well. The main reason it doesn't work is that patients don't take it. And um, you have to tell them, like, you have to take this every single day because starting stopping allopurinol or other uric acid lowering therapy, that will precip precipitate a flare. Or I had a patient recently that was um, sort of adjusting his dose every day, taking, he had some old 300 milligram tabs, but then he was taking 200 milligrams other, other days and he was flaring too. So it needs to be consistent, um, allopurinol every day. We start hundred milligrams a day in patients with normal kidney function or 50 milligrams a day in patients with CKD stage three or more. And we titrate it to a goal, a goal of less than six in patients with, um, no TOFI. And um, traditionally, we've also we've also tried to shoot for a goal of less than five in patients that patients that do have TOFI. Um, and the latest guidelines from the ACR they just say less than six for everybody. Um, also, importantly, in patients in whom you would like to start allopurinol, if that patient is of South Asian descent, if they're Han Chinese, uh, Korean, or Thai, or if they are an African American patient you should screen for HLA um, B5801 in those patients that this genetic allele is associated with adverse effects from allopurinol. So if your patient has that allele, then um, you should not use allopurinol. There's also fluvoxastat, which is much more expensive than allopurinol. There was um, 
a just a recent study finally that showed that allopurinol is not inferior to febuxostat. So there's no reason to think that febuxostat would be, you know, particularly stronger than allopurinol, although it's used in patients that fail fail allopurinol or otherwise um, have some contraindication to allopurinol and start at 40 milligrams a day in those patients in titrated goal. Um, there's also several several alternatives um, to these medications, but in the vast majority of patients are going to be on allopurinol. And um, there was the paper, I think it was from like the 80s, that sort of gave allopurinol a bad rap in, in patients that have CKD. But the, the truth is we use allopurinol in, in all of our patients, including those with CKD, including those with ESRD, we use allopurinol. Um, it's a very good medicine. Also, um, this is something else that's important, and it can be very important in patients that are resistant to taking something, a medication every day, or maybe your patient is sort of has a borderline uric acid, and maybe a few changes could make a big difference from them. So you could decrease serum uric acid by avoiding um, certain medications or foods. I had a patient that um, his, his uh, I got his uric acid to goal on 100 milligrams of allopurinol a day. And that, that um, patient was drinking 30 liquor drinks per week. And I told him like, if you could just cut that in half, you may not have to take this medicine every single day, but he, he was, he was more interested in um, drinking, but it can make a big difference for, for some patients. Also slow weight loss, rapid weight loss can precipitate flares, but slow weight loss can be very helpful. Also, adding losartan or exchange, if appropriate, exchanging, say, their lisinopril or other medication for losartan can be helpful because losartan is uric acidic. It helps you pee out uric acid. Um, and, um, and yeah, so um, this is a patient with enormous TOFI in the hands and patients will ask, like, will these things ever go away? And the answer is yes, they can. This is the same exact patient they can go away, but it takes a long time of having their uric acid consistently at goal. So there is a way to get rid of TOFI more rapidly. That's with pagloticase, but um, pagloticase is extremely expensive and it, it comes with a lot of other potential side effects. Um, yeah, Jen, I can, uh, there's a couple of questions in the okay. chat and <laughs> yeah. Greg, Greg's been very good at putting answers for many of them, but I wanted to mm -hmm. highlight a couple for, okay. for you. Um, the first is um, a question from Kristen. Is it true that you don't start allopurinol for first scalp flare until the flare has resolved? How long afterwards? Yeah, there was a comment on that on in the latest um, guidelines. And the in and, and truthfully, if you are treating that flare, um, then it's okay. It's okay to start allopurinol because the the um, the patient should be covered for additional flares if that patient is getting treatment. So, so you can actually, you can actually start it. Um, and, and then questions about testing, HLA testing. One is, do we screen people from any specific areas of Africa or just African-Americans? Yeah, I thought about that too. And there's not a, there's not like a, a specific, um, they don't talk about that specifically in the guidelines. They refer them to as these people as African-Americans. I would screen any black person. Okay. And then um, a, a pragmatic question, does insurance usually cover HLA test, testing prior to starting allopurinol? As far as I know, yeah. Okay. This person saw a case of SGIS and it's made uh, her more hesitant to prescribe without testing. Okay. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I, I hear that. Um, yeah, for sure. I, I can tell you, I've been a rheumatologist for a long, long time. and We didn't have this tool years ago. What we just did is went low and slow, uh, and that way you can avoid some of the hypersensitivity issues by, again, remembering the thing that Jenna said is start low and work your way up very slowly. So yeah. uh, this is this this only has been around for the last five to seven years, and I didn't have it for you know the majority of my my career. So just I think remember that also as in addition to the testing. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Thank you, Gigi. Start low, go slow. That's a great um, rule to live by with allopurinol. And I, I, I don't think everyone's practice is, is, is there yet. So, um, but that, that is, so the, the, the starting dose and the rate of increase of allopurinol is associated with adverse events. So, so start low, go slow, 
especially start low in your patients with, with CKD. So um, again, just a word about prophylaxis, like our, our, the patient in our question stem. Um, as we're going from high uric acid to our goal, we want those patients to be on, on prophylaxis to protect them from flares. And again, that's usually with colchicine, um, could be with NSAIDs, low-dose prednisone. We have a few patients in room clinic that are on anakenura for prophylaxis. And the ACR says that these patients should be on prophylaxis for at least three months. Um, but in some of my patients that have just like gout has totally wreaked havoc in their, in their lives and they have damage, I might go with a more cons conservative recommendation and that is to continue their prophylaxis until their uric acid is at goal consistently and they've had no flares for six months and no TOFI. Um, this three month rule only applies to patients without TOFI. If the patient has TOFI, then they will be on prophylaxis long-term until those tof TOFI have resolved. This is, um, just quickly, this is, a, this is a study that was done that looked at flares in patients that were initiating uric acid lowering therapy. So here on the bottom axis, this is a, the period of weeks. And over here, this is the percentage of patients that, that flared. And these lines represent, um, and it doesn't really matter which one is which because they're all following the same pattern, but they represent different doses of abuxostat um, versus 300 milligrams of allopurinol. And you can see that here in the first 36 weeks, these patients flared so much. 40% um, of them um, were flaring at this point. And so again, without prophylaxis, your patient is gonna say, this medicine is terrible. This medicine made me worse. And they're gonna dislike the doctor that gave it to them. So don't forget to give your patients prophylaxis. So this is, um, this is a patient that um, has gout and gout, the, the, the erosions that we see with gout, they're, they're typically distinct from, from erosions that could be from rheumatoid arthritis or psoriatic arthritis, although there's some overlap, but in general, this is a good example. So this is a periarticular. So it's not in the joint, it's, it's around the joint. So periarticular rat bite erosion, like a rat just took a chunk out of that, that bone. And so this patient, their gout was unfortunately untreated. And then ultimately you see here, they have a lot of, um, a lot of destruction. So they've got um, hallux valgus, um, here and, um, a lot of destruction erosion. They've, oh, they've eroded their toe completely here. Um, and, uh, this is an unfortunate consequence of poorly treated gout. All right. So 44 year old male with gout and mild TKD reports progressive weakness in his arms and legs, as well as paresthesia. He's been on colchicine and one tablet twice a day, and allopurinol 500 milligrams a day with good control of his gout. He also takes thyroid replacement, and he's had several short courses of prednisone when he ran out of his allopurinol and colchicine. So he is weak, and he's verified to have weakness on exam. So he has four plus strength in the arm abductors and three plus in hip flexors. Distally, his strength is intact. It's five out of five. His CK level is moderately elevated at 2,200 and his GFR is 30 milligrams per minute. So what's your next best step? Do you want to stop alpurinol? Do you think that's causing this? Do you want to stop colchicine? Do you want to increase his thyroid replacement? Maybe he's just hypothyroid or is this, is this related to steroids? Or do you completely avoid steroids? Okay, good. All right. So we got you guys. Okay. So um, this is actually related to the colchicine. So colchicine, colchicine can cause rarely, extremely rarely, and, and I've never seen it. I, Gigi may have seen it. It can cause a um, neuromyopathy. So the patients can 
be weak. And generally the lower extremities are weaker than upper extremities and it's a neuromyopathy. So they also have an axonal polyneuropathy and that portion may be asymptomatic or they may have mild sensory changes. This is a rare side effect of colchicine. Um, and it, thankfully it resolves when you, when you stop the colchicine. Um, Alpurinol is not associated with this adverse effect. Steroids are associated with myopathy. Patients can have a chronic steroid myopathy when they're on usually from moderate to high doses of steroids long-term. So usually like, you know, 20, 25 milligrams or more of steroids, um, those patients can um, be weak and their, their biopsy is, is distinct from that of colchicine myopathy. All right, so one uh, quick word about CPPD disease. So again, this is a condition that happens in older individuals. It can happen in younger individuals, but usually these patients are gonna be older than 55 years of age. It loves the knee and it loves the wrist. And when you aspirate this fluid, you're gonna see positively birefringent, um, these like sort of squares and, and rhomboid um, shaped, shaped crystals. There are several different presentations of CPPD. So CPPD could be a completely asymptomatic condition, just um, which we call chondrocalcinosis. And you can see chondrocalcinosis in x-rays of patients that just have osteoarthritis, and it may never cause any symptom at all. And then there are patients that can have acute flares of CPPD, and those are what are often called pseudogout, because it's like, it's a, it's a BBC joint. It's that, that hot, painful, swollen joint that the patient doesn't want to move. And, um, and then there are also patients can, that can have this chronic presentation of CPPD that's kind of, we call it pseudo-rheumatoid because it, it can be in the wrist, um, can, can affect MCPs, the knees, and those patients have more, um, more sort of character, uh, characteristically inflammatory pain, like that morning stiffness associated with their, their CPPD. So acutely, the treatment of CPPD is very similar to gout, can be um, treated with NSAID, steroids, colchicine, also anakinra. Um, you may, depending on the patient, um, uh, evaluate for underlying metabolic disease. And in patients that have frequent flares, of CPPD, or if they have these, this chronic pain and stiffness that usually responds quite well to either NSAID therapy or um, colchicine. So these are a couple images in, in CPPD. This is a knee where you can see some layering of calcium. And again, this patient, they could have, you know, CPP, you know, D acute flares, or they could just have chondrocalcinosis in association with their um, arthritis. There's more, more calcium in here. Again, they, uh, there's, it's called, classically called rhomboid um, shaped crystals that are positively birefringent. Okay, so this person is a 45 year old person that comes to clinic with two months of swelling in the left index finger and thumb. It's hard to bend it, and it's sort of moderately painful. And he's uh, noticed some sort of recent flaking in the scalp as well. His exam is otherwise unremarkable, except for the left hand as noted here. And this is the finger where he's having some discomfort. So would you like to start this person on naproxen twice a day, prednisone, 20 milligrams a day, methotrexate, 10 milligrams once a week, or a tannercept, 50 milligrams weekly. Jenna, I didn't see that poll. I'm sorry? I didn't see that poll. I don't have that. Oh, this one's not in there? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> Javel, can you launch a generic one? I can't see your poll, John, but great. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Thank sorry. you. Um, or we can, just, we can just go over the answer. Did any, anyone feel brave and want to say it out loud? I'll put it in the chat. I can't see the chat, but no, no one's put themselves out yet. But uh... <laughs> oh, oh, Mac, uh, 
should have known Mac would put his neck out there. One mil, one gram methylpred per day was Mac's idea. Okay. <laughs> I, I also want to know what do you call that finger? Yeah. I want, I want to give us a a name for what that finger is. It's a classic finding for this kind of arthritis. Yeah, good. <laughs> Room consult for sausage digit. <laughs> Can I also clarify for Jenna that I was 100% joking? The, yes. the look of terror on your face was pretty. <laughs> Thank it, you for clarifying. It is hard on chat to tell when someone's joking. <laughs> so, so, so answers include dactylitis, uh, sausage finger, yeah. That's perfect. Yeah, that's great. So this is dactylitis. This is um this patient has a refused to form swelling of this joint. So they've got um swelling sort of consistently in this aspect and then sort of this sort of tapering here. So this patient has dactylitis. Um so and um SGG was saying this is a classic finding in this type of arthritis. There's a, sh a short list of conditions that cause dactylitis. Um, our spondyloarthropathy is called dactylitis and then also sarcoidosis. And there are a number of medications that have been shown to be helpful. But in this situation, what I would reach for immediately would be naproxen. I would put this patient on naproxen twice a day. You can use prednisone in, in spondyloarthropathies, but, but classically, NSAIDs actually work better than steroids. Methotrexate is um, considered old, old faithful in, in the realm of, of rheumatology. We use it for so many different things. First line for rheumatoid arthritis. We use it for myositis, used for many skin diseases. But the thing that it doesn't work well for is, is emphysitis. Etanercept is also a, a great medicine that could be used, but um, we're sort of getting ahead of ourselves if we, if we choose etanercept right away. Um, and even if you wanted a tenorcept, you would have to go through approval process. So what I would reach for right away is um, naproxen. So this patient has psoriatic arthritis, a condition that presents with equal frequency in men and women. And somewhere, you know, the, the, um, the estimates vary. Somewhere up to 30% of patients with psoriasis will develop psoriatic arthritis. And there are different types of disease. They could have um, a posse arthritis, so up to four joints involved. They could have polyarthritis. DIP involvement is something that is, is, is common, and it, it distinguishes psoriatic arthritis from rheumatoid arthritis. Patients could have arthritis mutilans, which is a particularly deforming type of psoriatic arthritis. And then they can also have axial disease. Um, so sacred iliac involvement or involvement of the rest of their spine with their condition. So enthesopathy or enthesitis is a, is a common sort of um, pathogenesis and psoriatic arthritis. And I think the next slide will show some uh, pictures of enthesitis. So the joint distribution, it could be any joint, <laughs> any joint in your, in your, in your hand and wrist. Or it could be a whole finger, like our patient with their with the sausage digit. Um, but uh, again, the, what distinguishes this condition from rheumatoid arthritis is that that DIP involvement and also the dactylitis. So this this is a, an image um, from from Nature reviews, and actually a patient's dad brought me <laughs> brought me in this this image one day to clinic because I had been explaining to them what is the difference between synovitis and enthesitis. So um, this is a normal joint here um, with the, the, um, the bones coming together and, and cartilage here. And then there's the, the um, synovium here. And in this patient that has synovitis, the inflammation is, is inside of the joint, inside of the joint. And um, patients, however, that have emphysitis related to their spondyl arthritis, they might say to you, like the pain is around the joints. And that is absolutely accurate because emphysitis is inflammation is, is uh, inflammation where the tendon inserts into bone. So you see here at the insurgent sites, this patient is having inflammation. 
and common sites are at the Achilles tendon insertion, and then also where the plantar fascia inserts, and also at the um, at the epicondyles. So, a patient if they are having Achilles pain, if they're having pain higher up here, then that is generally not related to inflammatory arthritis. But if what they're telling you is that the pain is down here where this tendon is inserting into the calcaneus, that is the site of enthesitis. And actually an axial disease, this is a bunch of enthesitis as well. You know, those patients that actually, that ultimately get that bamboo spine. So um, uh, let's see, diagnosis. So again, this patient, um, uh, as you guys, you know, as you guys call it, dactylitis, also a sausage digit. That's a way to sort of ask the patient, like, do your fingers ever look like sausages? And what that actually is, is a bunch of emphysitis that is causing that dactylitis. Here's some more images um, for patients with psoriatic arthritis. So um, this patient has very dystrophic nails. Um, they have psoriasis. And frequently what you'll see um, is, is pitting in the nails. And that has an association with the arthritis um, that is associated with psoriasis. This is a patient that unfortunately has arthritis mutilans with their psoriatic arthritis. So this, um, does anyone know the name of this um, type of digit? It's one of those names in medicine that actually makes sense. <laughs> These, um, anyone brave out there? <laughs> uh, Ruth said crinkle finger. Crinkle finger. Hi, Ruth. Uh, swan neck deformity was another guess. Okay, okay. Um, so this year, these are called telescoping digits. You can see it's like folding a telescope upon itself. And um, that's what happens with arthritis mutilans that can happen with gout as well. Yeah, the other name for it is opera glass deformity. Aha. Uh -huh. And um, this is a toe with dactylitis, a little sausage toe. And, um, and then here is a DIP involvement in, in psoriatic arthritis. So sometimes you guys probably see some sort of enlarged DIPs with, um, with Heberden's nodes. And patients with psoriatic arthritis can have Heberden's nodes as well, but you can see here that sort of um, the sort of complete swelling of the joint rather than the distinct um, nodes here. All right, so we have a 55-year-old um, person with arthritis. A uh, 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 person with arthritis has this hand x-ray. The term used to describe this finding is, is it opera glass deformity? Um, pencil point deformity, pencil and cup deformity, or saber tooth deformity. Ah, good work guys, pencil and cup. So you can see here's the pencil and here's the cup. And this is a very common finding in psoriatic arthritis. Uh, here's another one here. And then also, as we mentioned, um, you know, a lot of DIP involvement in um, psoriatic arthritis, you, you can see here where there is a lot of erosive disease at the, at the DIPs. And then also here, this PIP. This patient there, MCPs are relatively spared. Jenna, there was a couple of questions just to highlight them and, and Greg uh, partly answered them. Uh, sort of the degree of correlation between skin findings and joint findings. It sounds like uh, the skin findings can happen after the joint findings. Mm -hmm. There's a follow-up question about um, uh, if well controlled, do they still develop joint involvement? Like, at um, least, I, I assume if the skin disease is well controlled, do they? 
are they still at risk for developing joint? Yeah, development? I would think so. I would think so. So, so to answer the first question, yeah, there's a, I remember when I was a fellow, there was a patient I was seeing at the VA who for like uh, 10 or more years had been treated for like quote unquote seronegative rheumatoid arthritis. And thankfully a lot of our therapies overlap with rheumatoid arthritis and psoriatic arthritis. And he told me he had a new rash and he pulled up his, his uh, pant leg and he had psoriasis all over his leg. So the arthritis can precede the, the psoriasis. Um, and then the other question about it being well-controlled, I'm not really sure. I mean, so many, it, when, when patients have severe psoriasis or, or if they have um, involvement of the genital area or the scalp, those patients generally are treated with um, systemic therapy. And then most of our systemic therapies overlap, um, so meaning that both they treat um, psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. There are some that, that don't, but um, the first line therapies um, generally treat both. In my experience, the this, this joints are easier to treat than the skin. Yeah. Often you'll, the joints will be doing fine and this, they'll have some residual skin, especially if it's scalp psoriasis, it's just a little mm -hmm. harder to treat. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, as Jen, Jen already mentioned, you know, a lot of the medications we use to treat psoriasis, treat psoriatic arthritis as well. So you get a twofer, which is kind of nice. But I have seen in the past needing more methotrexate to treat the skin than needing to treat the joints. That's just sort yeah, of- Yeah, absolutely. Universal. Yeah, that's a good point. So even though, you know, these patients, if they have a lot of enthesitis, methotrexate may not, may not be the best medicine for them. Methotrexate is very reliable with, with treating psoriasis. Um, and so we often will, will reach for the psoriasis if it's needed for skin or, or per, sometimes we feel like there's a synergistic effect with use um, methotrexate with our biologic therapies. So here is um, the list of medications that we have for psoriatic arthritis now. And it's, it's really incredible because this, this, this list has essentially doubled even in the time since I was a fellow. So it's really amazing. So again, the, the first line therapy is generally NSAIDs. And um, I would say like most patients are going to go on to need more therapy, but, but NSAIDs can be helpful for mild disease, or they can be helpful in combination with other therapies. If the patient's having more active disease or to kind of take the edge off. Um, again, you could use methotrexate, you could use lafunamide um, sort of with, with variable success. The TNF-alpha inhibitors are, are essentially first-line therapy for um, psoriatic arthritis and generally, generally work well for psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. Um, there's also a number of other biologic therapies, also JAK inhibitors and a PD-4 inhibitor called a Premolas, which have been approved in the past few years. And again, like some of this list has been growing at sort of an amazing um, rate. I've only had, I think one or two patients on gazuclomab and rizankizumab. Those were the, the, I think the latest that were approved. And um, most of the things on this list are also effective for psoriasis. Um, sort of with, with varying um, success rates. So a bad accept is not approved for, for psoriasis. And I don't think that it helps very much. Um, tovacitinib and ubacitinib are also not approved for psoriasis, but um, anecdotally, and according to our dermatology colleagues, they, they seem to be effective. So at some point, um, perhaps those will also be effective. Jenna, do you, uh, on that list, as a rheumatologist, do you go sort of in order that you've got it listed there in terms of thinking of classes of drugs? No, I should say it's not in order. I would say, um, so, so NSAIDs are always, you know, if the patient has no contraindication to NSAIDs, uh, NSAIDs can be a great, a great medication. When it comes to biologic therapy, the, the TNF inhibitors, um, are generally first line. And, and IOGG, you might have a, thoughts on this. Probably the TNF inhibitors and the IL-17 inhibitors probably have the best data for like reducing radiographic progression. I think ustekinumab doesn't have as, as good of data um, for that. So usually I would say in, in terms of biologic therapy, um, TNF inhibitors, and then um, maybe IL-17 inhibitors after that. And then it's sort of, variable um, based on patient, the patient after that. The, um, the JAK inhibitors, so, so patients with psoriasis, 
they are, um, particularly if they have like more severe psoriasis, they, they are at higher risk than the average patient for cardiovascular disease. So they are at higher risk for, for stroke, MI, also um, metabolic syndrome and uh, diabetes. So in, in these patients, um, the reason why I bring that up is because most recently there was a, a study that showed that tofacitinib may um may be associated with a higher risk of cardiovascular events so i think um i think that it may have changed practice for for some of us not necessarily to reach for jack inhibitors um as readily so um do you feel like in general that the the tfnf inhibitors have like a really great safety profile um, as do the IL-17 inhibitors and ustekinumab. We're still learning about guzuquimab and resinkizumab. A premolast, I think um, it's, it, it, I think maybe has been helpful to some patients in combination with other medications, but it's not, it's not, um, it doesn't have a great uh, reputation for efficacy. And then also it um, has been associated with worsening psychiatric disease, which is a big, big deal for almost everybody. Um, so those are reasons why that one hasn't, maybe hasn't been used as much. Well, a couple of concepts that Jen and I have learned from our dermatology colleagues as well is that steroids do work for psoriasis, but if you use high dose steroids, you get rid of the psoriasis and as you come down, you may actually instigate pustular psoriasis. So yeah. you gotta be careful with the use of prednisone. And the other thing yeah. that we've learned is that sometimes the TNF inhibitors can actually cause psoriasis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they upregulate uh, type one interferons in some patients. So just be aware of that, that somebody who's on a TNF inhibitor develops psoriasis, uh, that's, that's not unheard of. Yeah, that's, it's relatively common. But it may not happen again when you use a different TNF inhibitor or, or even restart the same one. So, um, so interesting. All right. So, 25 year old um, male recently develops urethritis, comes in for evaluation, He's noted to have mild discharge, redness in his eyes, reports joint swelling. He's also noted a rash on his feet. And on exam, he has bilateral conjunctivitis. And he has this rash that you see pictured on his feet and then also on his hands. He has dactylitis of several of his fingers and, um, and also of his toes. And he's got left knee swelling. So the most useful test right now, is it A, HLB27 testing, B, synovial fluid culture for gonococcus, um, a RPR test, or um, a test for chlamydia. This is going to be an interesting one to hear people's rationale. Yeah. There's quite there's quite a spread. Good. Nice. All right. Um, so, um, so the answer is is D, um, testing for for chlamydia. So this patient has reactive arthritis, previously known as Reiter's syndrome, and this type this type of arthritis is I find to be so fascinating. So these patients, they have an acute, very inflammatory posse to polyarthritis. So it could be a few joints affected, could be several um, joints affected. Um, it's more common in men than in women. And the arthritis typically happens about two weeks after some sort of infection. So commonly after, after chlamydia, but also um, uh, gastrointestinal infections like Shigella, Salmonella, um, also um, Yersinia species, C. diff, um, Campylobacter. And, um, and then often these patients will have um, HLB27, particularly if they're infected with uh, Yersinia. So the um, distribution um, typically affects MCPs, PIPs, wrists, and can also cause dactylitis in that, that family of, of spondyloarthritis. 
Um, again, the symptoms usually appear a couple of weeks after their, their illness and they can have arthritis, they can have enthesitis, again, with the heel, um, heel uh, insertion, the Achilles or other areas, dactylitis, they can have sacroiliitis, they can have inflammatory eye disease, so uveitis or conjunctivitis. They may have um, some oral ulcerations, um, nail changes, uh, uh, circinate balanitis, and they may have that skin finding that we saw in our patient, which is keratoderma blenerogicum. Um, you can also have urethritis, urethritis prostatitis, and these are um, some, some photos. So this patient has um, cytovitis or this like kind of dactylitic looking finger here. This is a patient with um, teosinovitis, I'm guessing of the um, posterior tibia tendon and a patient with nail changes. So these patients, what, what happens to these patients? This is, this is sort of your, your immune system kind of freaking out in the setting of an infection. The infection is not causing the disease. It just stimulated your immune system in a way that, that it attacked you and caused these symptoms. So these patients, um, the, the prognosis is generally, generally good. So most of the time it resolves in a number of weeks, sometimes months, but at least a quarter of these patients um, can go on to have persistent disease and end up acquiring um, through chronic long-term therapy and can have um, potentially other morbidity associated with this. And the treatment, because this is a, another type of spondyl arthritis, the, the treatment follows that, that same um, sort of pathway as psoriatic arthritis. This is um, circinate balanitis. Okay. 32 year old woman comes to clinic with the one month of pain and stiffness in the hands, wrists, knees, and feet. Takes her up to two hours to loosen up. She takes naproxen, kind of takes the edge off. Um, someone gave her some prednisone um, for a rash recently and like, wow, all of her symptoms resolved. But then when she stopped the prednisone and everything came back. Um, so on exam, she has tenderness, mild swelling in her PIPs, MCPs, and um, in her MTPs. So which lab test has the highest specificity for her manifestations? Is it an ESR, rheumatoid factor, anti-CCP antibody, or an ANA? Oh, whoops. Ah. Nice. All right. You guys are good. It's anti-CCP. So this patient has rheumatoid arthritis. It's an inflammatory polyarthritis. It uh, affects more women than men. Uh, generally wrists, MCPs, also PIPs, spares the DIPs, a rheumatoid factor sensitivity, um, usually around 75%, but not a high specificity. You might see rheumatoid, a rheumatoid factor in other conditions like hepatitis C, other autoimmune diseases like Sjogren's, MCTD, or patients with um, uh, Wallenstrom's um, or cardioglobulinemia, fungal or TB infections, anti-CCP, when it's done in our lab, has very high sensitivity, um, sensitivity, uh, uh, sorry, specificity of 96%. So um, in our lab, the test that's run is an anti-CCP IgG, and that is the one that has very high specificity. You might see in some outside labs now, they are running a combined IgA, IgG, anti-CCP, and that test actually has lower specificity because the um, IgA may be falsely positive. Um, and the idea is, or the thinking, current thinking is that falsely positive generally in older women. So um, sometimes we like to repeat this in our lab because we, we have the best immunology lab. Um, and these antibodies may be present for 14 years before diagnosis. And we know this um, from a lot of studies that are done in uh, first degree relatives of patients with rheumatoid arthritis. Um, so this is a patient with early rheumatoid arthritis. And you can see here that it looks like there's some, some fullness of um, the, the PIPs in this particular patient. MCPs actually look okay to me in this, in this photo. 
Um, this patient though, however, you see a lot of um, swelling here in um, MCPs here as well. And then um, again, a lot of swelling here and this patient may be um, developing some uh, subluxation of these joints, which is an un unfortunate consequence of rheumatoid arthritis. And you can see in this patient, they have um, subluxation of their MCPs as well as some ulnar deviation. And um, the toes, uh, cock up deformity, and I think it's called crossover deformity as well. You can also see a lot of other unfortunate consequences in the feet. Um, hallux valgus is very common um, in patients with rheumatoid arthritis, um, as well as uh, subluxation, and also just you can dislocate um, toes as well. Uh, this is Renoir. He was an artist that had um, rheumatoid arthritis back when we didn't have good therapy for this. And so you can see his um, his hands becoming deformed here, are quite deformed here and even more so here. And then he's in a chair in this photo and then a, a wheelchair later in life. This is, I think it was his muse that became his wife. Um, so in, in, um, in uh, x-rays of patients with rheumatoid arthritis, you can see um, peri periarticular osteopenia. So the, the bones just look, a bit more, um, a bit more uh, dark than they should look in patients that have rheumatoid arthritis. Also, um, marginal erosions in the joints, um, subluxation, as we were talking about. So these are just, just like, just totally um, eroded MCPs, and these are um, subluxed joints. You can see that this. This, the joints are no longer aligning, and this one has um, subluxus is beneath the um, proximal phalanx. So, okay, 55 year old man with 15 years of rheumatoid arthritis comes to clinic with dyspnea um, with dyspnea on exertion. He's noted this with um, stairs about for the past six months now, but unfortunately, he's been having more dyspnea just with with walking more than a quarter of a mile. He reports persistent non-productive cough. He's had um, no PND, orthopnea, lower extremity edema, or wheezing. So um, your most useful next test would be high resolution CT of the chest, echocardiogram, right heart cath, or a, um, a VP scan of the lungs, relation perfusion pain. Oh, very good. <laughs> okay, very good, guys. So one unfortunate complication of rheumatoid arthritis is interstitial lung disease. And then um, this is something that, that GG sees a lot in our in our room ILD clinic. So patients um, with rheumatoid arthritis can have interstitial lung disease, usually a UIP pattern. Um, and then there are some other uh, sort of extra articular manifestations of rheumatoid arthritis, which we sometimes see, including um, scleritis and also nodules, which can look um, look very similar to TOFI that you might see in patients with gout, and in some situations have been confused with TOFI. Um, but you can see um, nodular disease. These patients often have a very high rheumatoid factor. Other Uncommon but in, important complications of rheumatoid arthritis are Felty syndrome, which which we really don't see often anymore now that we have really great therapy for for rheumatoid arthritis. Also, um, C1 C2 subluxation. So rheumatoid arthritis in general um, does not have a, a predilection for the spine, but in patients that have generally and and maybe maybe it's happening in, in other patients that we're not realizing it, but but generally the patient I think of that will have C1, C2 disease as someone that has um, longstanding, perhaps not very well controlled rheumatoid arthritis. 
um, so they can have subluxation of these joints. So it's, it's important to you know, identify patients that may be at risk for this, or if patients are having a lot of neck pain, you can send them down to do a, a flexion extension film. And it's especially important if this patient is going to have surgery because the anesthesiologist needs to know if they're um, at, at risk for myelopathy with um, manipulating their, their neck. Um, septic arthritis, as we talked about, also um, tendon ruptures, which can unfortunately happen in patients that have just chronically uncontrolled inflammation. It kind of just gnaws away at their structures until they rupture their tendons. So this is a patient that has um, extension of tendon ruptures. So they're no longer to extend these digits. This can can be be repaired um, by ortho, but um, I've seen it re-rupture again, unfortunately. Um, and then also rheumatoid vasculitis. Patients can develop a vasculitis associated with, with rheumatoid arthritis. Again, not super commonly seen um, anymore, but we always think about it. So therapy for rheumatoid arthritis, again, this is just rapidly expanding. Um, important to recognize these patients and, and start treatment early. And also, if the patient presents to clinic with, a, with what seems to be aggressive disease, so if they have erosions at presentation, if they have extra articular features like rheumatoid art, um, nodules, then we tend to be a little bit more aggressive with their therapy. Um, here you see methotrexate is, a, is, a, is our anchor medication. It's our first line therapy for rheumatoid arthritis. And, um, and then also patients with rheumatoid arthritis, there have been several studies that support this sort of treat to target um, way of managing rheumatoid arthritis, meaning that if you see your patient every three months and do a, a disease assessment, adjust their medications as needed to control their disease, that patient is likely to do much better in the long term. And so we get to know these patients really, really well. We, we, see, them, we see them frequently and we adjust their medications as needed um, to keep them really well controlled because if they're really well controlled, they're, they are unlikely to develop those deformities that, that we um, looked, looked at. So you can um, use classic non-biologic DMARDs like methotrexate tends to be first line. If I have somebody that has very mild early rheumatoid arthritis, sometimes they'll do well with just hydroxychloroquine and, and that's a win because um, hydroxychloroquine is a, is a great um, safe medicine that we like to use. Regarding biologic therapies, there are um, TNF inhibitors. Sometimes we use, um, and again, this is not in any, any order as... Um, as uh, John was asking previously, but um, except for TNF inhibitors tend to be first line. Um, often some of the more advanced therapies in terms will say you must try and fail a TNF inhibitor first, which in most cases is, is fine because they, they tend to be generally um, very effective and, and great safety profile for the majority of our patients. Um, also Abatacept, we have IL-6 therapies like Trisalizumab, Sirolimab, and um, the JAK inhibitors as we discussed previously. Um, when I'm counseling people about hydroxychloroquine, it always sounds scary because we have to tell them about this risk of retinopathy that is associated with long-term use of hydroxychloroquine. Um, but I try to qualify that by saying, this is actually the safest medicine that we prescribe in all of rheumatology because, because generally it is, it's, it tends to be very, um, very, very safe for our patients and the methods that are used by ophthalmology to detect the retinopathy at this point are very, very sensitive, and they can pick up any changes of um, uh, that could suggest retinopathy before it affects the patient's vision. Um, sulfasalazine, classic medicine that is used um, for rheumatoid arthritis and also spondyloarthritis. It's a great medicine. It's sort of mild. I think of it on the same uh, level as hydroxychloroquine. Um, it's rare to have um, these side effects. Usually people just complain of a little GI upset. Methotrexate, um, again, old faithful, but we always counsel people about the risk of, um, it is a chemotherapy. So they're at risk for oral ulcers, risk for hair loss, um, risk of liver toxicity, also um, bone marrow depression and, and uh, suppression and rarely pneumonitis. And um, TNF inhibitors, they tend to be very, very safe medicines. There's a, a slight, slightly higher risk of um, infection in these patients. TB reactivation is the one that we worry the, the most about. And so any biologic that we're starting, we always make sure that um, patients are tested for TB, hep C, and hep B before we start these medications. But um, 
especially TB in TNF inhibitors. So, um, Janet, well, um, it's 1022. Yeah. Uh, uh, I don't know if uh, this might be a good time for a quick break or if you want to. We have a break. I think it's a couple slides um, from, from here. Yeah. Okay. Um, so um, real quick. So um, this is a 48-year-old gentleman. He is a wrestler. He complains of bilateral hand pain. He has morning stiffness, but uh, has pain with activity, especially driving his muscle boat on Lake Washington. The um, MCPs are painful. He's been on methotrexate because someone thought that maybe he had rheumatoid arthritis, but it has not benefited him. His tenderness and swelling of his second, third, and fourth MCP joints on both hands. And this is his x-ray. So do you want to start insets, reassure him? Check a rheumatoid factor again. Maybe it's positive now. Um, start him on low dose prednisone to see if that helps, or check a ferritin. Oh, wow. Good job, guys. So um, so many of you noticed that this patient has these classically called hooked osteophytes in their, in their MCP. So in this patient, I would check a ferritin. I'm worried that this patient might have hemochromatosis. Um, and uh, I think Gardner's rule number, uh, I think 13. So in, in arthritis, un unusual places think unusual diseases. So very quickly, um, before we get to our break. So um, osteoarthritis is another type of arthritis that we, that we sometimes see, and you, like, you all are very familiar with this type of osteoarthritis. The, um, this, this type of arthritis tends to spare the MCP joints, but affects the DIPs and PIPs. Um, this is a patient that has the um, typical signs of osteoarthritis, which are Hepperton's nodes, on these more um, distal joints. And um, I think I see some Bouchard's nodes in here as well on the PIPs. So um, these patients have joint space narrowing. They often have osteophytes and subchondral sclerosis on their x-ray. And the knee, you typically see um, medial narrowing of the joint space prior to, to a more lateral joint space narrowing. And here's a patient with, um, with a severe hip OA and OA in the right hip. Um, and just very quickly, the, the, the ACR came out with some really nice guidelines for treatment of osteoarthritis in 2019. And this is not all osteoarthritis, but, but the hip, the knee, and the hand. And um, this is a great reference for, for people to look at to, to, to um, treat this very, very common condition. So the, the items that are in the, the darker green boxes, these are strongly recommended and the lighter boxes are conditionally recommended. So exercise recommended for everybody. Um, and then um, I'll let you guys take a look at this on your own since we're a little, little short on time. Um, major causes of D DIP arthritis. Um, so at this point we've reviewed all of these. So osteoarthritis, this is a patient with gout, gouty tophi, um, sort of in the area of their Hepperton's nodes. And then also this is our patient with um, psoriatic arthritis. Um, so 30 year old woman uh, complains of three weeks of fever to 101, sore throat, lumps in her neck, joint pain in her hands, wrists, knees, and intermittent rash on the chest and extremities. She works as an elementary school teacher. She's got a fever, pulse is 100. She has a macropapular rash on her chest, arms, legs, and large cervical lymph nodes, swelling of the wrist and knees. She's got a leukocytosis. Her hematocrit is 34%. Her ALT and ALC are elevated, and her CRP is 200. Um, what is the next most helpful test?
Nice. Okay. I, I probably really want to check all those things. Um, but I think Parvo virus is a great, is a great idea because she's a school teacher and she has that, that characteristic, um, rash and polyarthritis. So there are a number of viruses that can, can cause this acute inflammatory polyarthritis and Parvo um, virus is certainly a big one. Um, also rubella hepatitis B, um, which we don't see, you know, super commonly, and then also hepatitis C. So good, good to think about all of these things. Um, Lyme disease can cause arthritis. Usually, it's a later finding the arthritis, and usually it uh, affects larger joints, and they're not typically super painful. They're kind of swollen without a lot of pain. Gonococcal arthritis that we discussed. Still disease, which I don't know about you guys, I was feeling a little worried uh, in this particular patient about adult onset stills disease. Um, this patient was febrile. She had a rash. She had um, arthritis. She had a leukocytosis. So she's meeting many of these criteria. She also had lymphadenopathy, elevated liver enzymes. So these patients, um, if they have adult onset stills, they will have a high ferritin, negative ANA, and negative rheumatoid factor. Also serum sickness, which can happen um, after exposures to drugs like antibiotics and um, other medications. And lupus, we're going to talk about <laughs> shortly. This is parvovirus um, in a kid that uh, sort of slap cheek, cheek appearance, parvovirus on the trunk, erythema migrans in a patient with Lyme disease. And again, this is our pustule in, in GC. The adult onset stills rash um, tends to be evanescent. So it's usually present when the patient is febrile and resolves when they are not febrile. It's not pyritic. It's classically salmon colored. All right. So uh, I think this is the last case. So a uh, 22 year old male complains of three weeks of low back pain. Oh, especially in the night and early morning feels better during the day when he's active. Um, his exam's normal. He's got a positive favor or sorry, his general exam is normal. He has a positive favor on both sides. The Schober test is normal. Hyperextension of the lumbar spine causes pain. He's got um, hematocrit 34%. His ESR is elevated as a 45. And his, um, his x-ray of the pelvis shows erosion at the sacroiliac joints. So do you want to start this person on an NSAID? Do you want to check HLAB 27? Do you want to get a CT of his SI joints to take a better look at the bones? Or do you want to order an MRI to look at the SI joints? Okay, good. We had a good good spread here. So, um, so in this particular patient, you know, he very well may be HLAB twenty seven positive. Um, there is a high association between HLAB twenty seven and axial spondyloarthritis. Um, it doesn't it doesn't change our our management in this situation. I think I think he's uncomfortable. I think probably the um, the first thing I would probably do is start him on an NSAID, which NSAIDs are characteristically helpful for axial spondyl arthritis. So this condition more common in men and presents before age 40. They have inflammatory low back pain. So the pain is worse in the night and early in the morning. It often wakes them from sleep. They can have peripheral arthritis. Again, this is a, one of our emphysopathies. Um, women that have it, they're more likely to develop C-spine disease. And um, these patients can also have eye disease. NSAIDs are first line therapy. And then um, we can also use TNF inhibitors, IL-17 inhibitors like secukinumab or exikizumab, and then also upadacitinib um, was just approved for ankylosing spondylitis. So this patient with sacroiliitis. So they have um, this uh, sort of indistinct or sort of eroded border of their, their sacroiliac joints. This is a, taking a look closer up. And then I, I think they have a little bit more whitening here than you would typically see. This is a, a CT. So the CT is um, gives you a really in-depth look up at the, um, the bones to be able to see those erosions. Um, look here. Oh my gosh. This, this is like a very, very eroded uh, sacroiliac joints. 
Um, sometimes we also order MRI. MRI gives you, this is not MRI obviously, but MRI gives you a better sense of sort of active inflammation. And this is a patient here on the right that has um, unfortunately very progressed axial spondyloarthritis. They have a bamboo spine. So this patient has some early features of developing the bamboo spine. They have the, the squaring of the vertebrae with these sort of white, um, we'll call them rominous lesions or shiny corners. And these are the patients that can, can go on to develop this um, bamboo appearance of their spine. This is again, enthesitis. And um, important complications, they can um, unfortunately have um, fractures, lung disease, which is really rare. Um, uveitis can be, be quite severe, neurologic consequences um, if they have uh, issues with their spine and, and um, other conditions as well. Um, all right, so this is a 68 year old woman coming to clinic with recent onset pain in the shoulders, especially early in the morning. She has to roll herself out of bed. Um, she doesn't feel loose until 10 a.m. Also complains of hip pain and stiffness. She's had, she has hypothyroidism, hyperlipidemia, diabetes. Um, she's on levothyroxine, simvastatin, metformin. And on exam, it, it's just so hard for her to raise her shoulders. It's just really uncomfortable. So in this patient, do you want to check her TSH, send her to PT for range of motion exercises? check her inflammatory markers or check AACK. She's not, she's not weak, but she really is having trouble moving. Nice. <laughs> okay, so um, so good work, guys. So most people wanted to, to check her inflammatory markers, which is which is a great idea. So this this woman has um, a condition that is is quite common in rheumatology called uh, polymyalgia rheumatica. So it, it tends to be more common in women, and it's it's rare or even unheard of in people that are younger than 50 years of age. So it's, it happens in people that are older than 50, usually people that are between 70 and 80. They have profound morning stiffness. They, that, that what our patient said about rolling out of bed, that's very common. Like I have to roll myself out of bed and they feel very, very stiff um, for much of the day. If you were to image their joints, you would see synovitis in the in the, the shoulders, around the hips. Um, many of these patients will also develop giant cell arteritis. So in all these patients, we always want to screen them for symptoms of giant cell arteritis, which Gigi is going to talk about. And the reason to grab those inflammatory markers is because they are almost always elevated in patients with PMR. So this is a very important test to get before you start them on steroids. Um, these patients, they get other lab abnormalities. They can also have anemia um, and other findings. We treat these patients with, with steroids and um, hopefully at some point we'll have a better medicine to treat them with, but um, generally it's with steroids and um, generally for, for a year or two. All right, we're gonna take a break for, I don't know if we should take a break or if we should just let people break as they need to. Let's take a break. Uh, I think that people probably need to stretch their legs. Okay. Um, and so uh, why don't we regroup at 1042? Okay. We're going to uh, we're talk about myositis and some other connective tissue diseases. Um, if you have a question, uh, please put it in the chat. Uh, Jenna will answer that for you. Um, and uh, also we may, we may ask you a few more questions uh, and get you uh, to wake you up here a little bit. So our first case is a 35 year old woman with dermatomyositis diagnosed one month ago based on uh, skin rash, which comes to follow up. Her CK was not elevated, but had ischemic 
lesions on fingers as well as some alopecia. Uh, initial RX was prednisone in 60 milligrams a day, which is sort of a usual dose. Um, she's put on low dose aspirin because of her digital ischemia, calcium channel blockers, uh, feeling better by report, uh, but had one week of increased seen uh, just beyond exertion when climbing stairs right before she comes for her visit. Exam shows classic DM rash on face, hands, trunk, with healing distal ischemic lesions on several fingers. She now has scattered rowels on her lung examination. Her heart examination is normal. No muscle weakness is noted. And I might throw in that this patient is probably Asian. So next diagnostic test would be what? Echo, CT, VQ, MRI. And the answer is, survey says, yeah, CT scan of the chest is correct. Echo uh, may be useful. Um, anybody know if this patient probably has an Asian woman with dermatomyositis with now developing what looks like ILD? What antibody do you think she's going to have? Why don't you put it in the chat or if somebody want to just you know, say it, that's fine as well. Anybody? Somebody mentioned anti-synthetase syndrome, which is. That's a great uh, uh, thought, but this patient, and we'll talk about this, this patient has an MDA5 dermatomyositis, which is scary. Um, and if you see one of these patients and diagnose them, make sure you call me or Bridget Collins right away so that we can start them on therapy because these patients can die from, from this condition. So uh, dermatomyositis, uh, kids get it as well as adults, women more than men. Malignancy is still an issue in these patients. And we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, mostly solid organ tumors, about 15% of people with dermatomyositis will develop a tumor usually within the first three years uh, of diagnosis. There's classic dermatomyositis with rash and, and muscle weakness. There's amyopathic dermatomyositis, means you have the rash, but not the, not the muscle disease. There's also hypomyopathic dermatomyositis, which means you have a little bit of muscle disease, um, but mostly skin. Uh, recognize the CK may be normal in some of these DM patients, even if they have some weakness. Treatment is typically steroids, methotrexate, azathioprine, MMF, IVIG, rituximab. And our patients with MDA5 disease and ILD, we use a lot of calcium urine inhibitors, namely tacrolimus. The other feature that you probably don't need to know for particularly is you get this perifascicular, here's a fascicle, and you get this atrophy of the fibers on the margins, on the perifascicular areas, uh, typical of dermatomyositis, because this tends to be a vasculopathic sort of disease. Here's a classic Gottron sign. And I can see them asking you this on your board examinations. See the, uh, the redness over the knuckles. You also see this redness around the, uh, uh, the cuticle as well. This is a classic DM lesion over the elbow. Uh, chronically, you can develop these, this atrophy. I've seen several patients with this over the years. Um, so Gottron's papules was atrophy of the skin. And this is from Andrea Kalous, if any of you worked with Andrea in dermatology. She often talks about, <clears throat> about this. You get the nail fold capillary enlargement. You get uh, prominent cuticular overgrowth, sort of very typical of dermatomyositis. And uh, here's an example of the heliotrope rash. And uh, here's the shawl sign. Uh, you can get rash over the mid back as well. Uh, you get a V of the neck uh, rash. And you can also, in dermatomyositis, you get some fairly severe calcinosis. This can be really, really limited. And the antibody you want to remember for the board tests and patients who have calcinosis is the NXP2. It's very distinctive. So I can imagine they, they could ask you about that. Um, on the, the knee x-ray is one of my patients, actually, who had dermatomyositis. And I put them on the Gardner calcinosis concoction. And this is what happened. Yay, actually it worked. It often doesn't work very well. 
but um, in this case, it did. And she's doing quite well at the current time. This is one of my patients who had dermatomyositis and had these collections of liquid calcium in various areas. Occasionally, it would break through and drain. It was one of the most painful things uh, I've ever seen a patient deal with. All right, here's some antibodies. Uh, again, just to keep in mind, and uh, the three that I want you to really remember are in the middle there. So the MI2 you know, is part of the myositis panel and usually it suggests for the mild disease. NXP2, you can get some distal weakness in these patients. You get calcinosis and you get increased risk of cancer. The, really the one for malignancy is this TIF1 gamma. And 75% um, of those patients who have the antibody and are over 40 will likely develop a malignancy. So that's one you want to check for in the myositis panel in your dermatomyositis patients. MDA5, everybody needs to have that checked as well, especially if you're Asian and especially if you have amyopathic disease. SAE, don't worry about so much. They won't ask you that on boards. And then I don't know how important it is clinically either, um, but definitely those middle three antibodies are very important to, to think about and to keep in the back of your mind. So again, just another word about MDA5. I could see them asking you about this on your boards just because it's a very distinctive presentation and it has a very significant outcome. So um, a big chunk of people who have this will develop ILD, but still some people uh, without MDA5 will develop ILD as well. Again, this ra it's, it's associated with this rapidly progressive ILD, particularly in amyopathic again, and in Asians. If you're a European and have MDA5, your outcome isn't quite as severe as if, as if you're Asian for some darn reason. We also see some interesting cutaneous manifestations, including ulcerations, alopecia, paniculitis. So I've seen some, I've actually had two patients recently come to us with this MDA5 dermatomyositis and ILD clinic, and they have fairly severe digital ischemia and ulcerations, and it's gotten much better with, uh, with the usual therapy. Oh, let's look at this. Look at this. Uh, this is a, a case of somebody who passed away, this uh, CT scan. So you see some organizing pneumonia and you see more and then you see more and more. So this can happen over the matter of weeks to a month or two. Um, and again, so early uh, we get these patients in and treat them, the less likely you are to get into trouble. All right. This next one is a relatively new description. It's only been around for about 10 years um, and it's called immune uh, mediated necrotizing myopathy. So on biopsy, what you see is lots of necrosis with little inflammation. And there's three categories. There's this SRP, uh, antibody positive, that is very hard to treat. There's patients who have uh, statin-associated uh, immune mediated necrotizing myopathy. These patients develop antibodies after having been on statins. Uh, and then you get a seronegative immune mediated necrotized myopathy. It's often associated with malignancy. These patients have proximal muscle weakness, which can be quite profound, high levels of CK, and resistant to treatment, except uh, data suggests that IVIG is very useful for these patients. And they tend to have posterior thigh and gluteal muscles. So in the chat, I also so these, these, these patients who are on statins, they, they develop uh, antibodies to uh, HMG CoA reductase. What just what other what are muscle issues can you get from statins? There's three things I tend to think about. One of them is this immune mediated necrotizing myopathy. What are the other two that I'm thinking about? Guess what I'm thinking. Uh, we'll play that game. Uh, what are two other th muscle things you might see in somebody who's on a statin? I will let John and Jenna sort of monitor that to see. No guesses so far. Anybody? No guesses. What? <laughs> Any anybody yet? Rhabdo. Yeah. So, uh, so this is an auto. So the, the thing we're talking about here is an autoimmune reaction to having statins upregulated. And when you take a statin, you tend to upregulate HMG-CoA reductase uh, 
uh, receptors on the cell, and they, then you get an autoimmune reaction. It actually has, a, we'll talk about in a second, very strong HLA association. So the other two are myalgias, which I'm a statin user and I got myalgias. I had to change my statin drug. And the other one is rhabdomyolysis in some cases. So those are probably direct toxicity of the medication. This is an autoimmune Good work, good work guys. Both of those were mentioned. Okay, good, yay. Okay. So SRP myopathy, severe muscle weakness, marked necrosis, some ILD, very resistant to therapy. Uh, HMG Cori reductase myopathy, uh, statin exposure is very strong, strong HLA association uh, in kids and adults. And the antibodies are, have a high sensitivity and specificity, which is very, very helpful in these situations. Of interest, there is a food that is statin-like uh, that might give you uh, immune, immune, immune uh, th the same process. This is a fascinating little factoid for you. And it's oyster mushrooms. So people who eat oyster mushroom soup in particular, have been known to develop immune-mediated necrotizing myopathy. Andrew Maiman, who's one of the authors of this paper, came and gave us a talk one time, and he actually had a patient who had this process based on eating oyster soup, oyster mushroom soup. Fascinating little. They don't ask you that on the boards, but you know, it's just sort of interesting. All right, uh, case 13, 65-year-old male is referred for progressive weakness in his forearms and quadriceps with some atrophy. His CK is elevated, but not dramatically so. Biopsy demonstrates an inflammatory myopathy and a trial of steroids brought his CK down, but did not improve his strength. He has difficult rising from a chair on the exam table. His shoulder abductors are four out of five. Wrist extensors are four minus out of five. Finger flexors are only two out of five. And this is a clue to the diagnosis on this patient. There is atrophy of the forearms, left greater than right. Knee extension is weak as well. And there's atrophy of the quadriceps. So the next step in this patient is to do what? And the survey says the, the harder questions are always associated with slower answers. <laughs> the other thing about this test, I, I, I test for the mix app and um, yeah, I put in three treatments and, and one sort of non-therapy. So, and the actual answer is D, I refer to occupational therapy. Let me know what this diagnosis is. This is a classic presentation. Of a, of a form of myopathy that they'll love to ask you on the board. Do you know what this is? No taking. Anything in, anything in the chat? Nothing in the chat. Nothing in the oh, chat? Oh, actually, someone says inclusion, meaning inclusion body myositis. Yes, awesome. That's great. Yeah. So this is classic case of inclusion body myositis. So inclusion body myositis uh, often is, gets um, mistaken for polymyositis. It, looks, it can look similar in biopsy unless you look really hard or get lucky. It affects men, uh, sort of my age men, you know, people over the age of, uh, men over the age of 50, get a modest elevation of CK that may respond somewhat to therapy. You get forearm atrophy and quadricep atrophy. You get finger flexor weakness. And I used to work in the... Uh, neuromuscular rheumatology clinic. And, and Mike Weiss taught me that that's a key. If your finger flexors are weak, uh, that's most likely going to be something like an inclusion body myositis. And also I saw uh, Michael actually make a diagnosis. And I'll show you this in a second, simply based on the MRI scan findings. You also see these, I think you can see here, these rim vacuoles, that's, those are classic for inclusion body myositis. And to date, there have been no dramatic successes in terms of therapy. So here's one of my patients. She actually has Sjogren's syndrome. And we actually wrote a paper on the coexistence of Sjogren's and IBM. Um, this patient has a classic teardrop sign in the middle there. She can't make an O with her fingers because her finger flexors are too darn weak. 
And here's a picture of somebody from the British Medical Journal showing you the quad atrophy, so typical of this disease. Can you see the forearm atrophy in this patient as well? I and mean, that's fairly typical. This disease often takes, you know, year, it doesn't come in months like, uh, or weeks to months like uh, most of our inflammatory forms of myopathy. This happens over months to years. So look at this, uh, it, it tends to spare the rectus femoris, the RF, and affects the vastus lateralis and vastus medial. This is a T2 weighted image showing you um, fat. Um, and you can see in the other one over time, you see the, the, the fat replacement in the vastus lateralis, the vastus medialis, and, and eventually the, the rectus femoris as well, where the posterior muscles are spared. So I, yeah, Michael Weiss made a diagnosis, simply looking at somebody's MRI scan and noticing these changes. Um, again, there's no treatment for IBM. There have been a bunch of stuff that's been tried. Is it inflammatory myopathy or is it degenerative myopathy? Uh, I think the jury is still out. So we're gonna talk about some overlap myositis subgroups as well. Somebody mentioned uh, anti-synthetase syndrome. Before I started working in ILD clinic, I thought this was a rare disease. It, I think it just because I missed it a lot. Um, I have a, now a list of about 100 patients I follow with this condition in the ILD rheumatology clinic. So there are some, there's eight currently recognized anti-RNA synthetase antibodies, or probably more in the future. And there are six possible manifestations. Of interest, some of these patients can, can unfold over months to years. They may not present with all their symptoms all at once. Um, here's a patient with classic mechanics hands. Um, see that it looks dry, cracked, like you've been working in cement or working on the car. Here's one of my patients with anti synthetase And look at the side of the fingers that are all cracked and dried. There also is a finding you can see on the foot that's very similar. Uh, I won't ask you for the name, but it's uh, but it would be it's called it's called hiker's foot, and the same sort of thing you can see on the hands, you can see on the feet. So here are the manifestations: interstitial lung disease. You can get all kinds of different forms, mostly NSIP, myositis, which is can be either DM or PM. Proximal muscle weakness, Raynaud's phenomena, usually not severe in these patients. Uh, arthropathy can be RA-like uh, in some patients with actually having erosions, although mostly it's felt to be non-erosive. Fever, uh, I have seen one patient with severe fever. She actually ended up dying from her disease. And the mechanics hands, uh, you know, is, is, depends on what series you, you refer to, can be quite common. Um, the most common antisynthetase um, antibody is to, anybody know? I think I may have had it before. What is the most common antisynthetase antibody directed against? Let me know the name. It's on the ANA panel. Yes, we have two, two takers saying anti-Joe. Anti -Joe yes, awesome, yeah. Um, our, our, our myositis panel actually looks for five of them. There's three that are so rare that they don't, I don't think they actually bother looking for them. Good. Yeah, Joe one is one of the more common ones. Get a little factoid for you. Some of those patients can actually have anti-SSA as well and a specific SSA, which is uh, row 52. So somebody comes in with a positive SSA, which may be in isolation and has mechanics hands or whatever, uh, make sure you think about antisynthetase syndrome because that may be the first antibody you find. So polymyositis is actually becoming less common diagnosis as these other processes are recognized. And somebody in a, uh, from France, uh, France my myositis specialist suggests that polymyositis may at some time just go away as we understand more about the disease. Proximal muscle weakness, elevated muscle enzymes, abnormal EMG, no characterizing antibodies. And here's a biopsy of somebody showing endomesial infiltrate on their uh, muscle biopsy. Treatments with uh, pretty much the same, methotrexate, azathioprine, sometimes in combination with those two, mycophenolate, IVIG, and rituximab. All right, we're going to move on to the other connective tissue diseases. Although I always have a trouble with this, uh, this term, 
I think of true connective tissues are like a Marfan syndrome or those sort of things. The, I always call these the, the autoimmune, uh, inflammatory autoimmune diseases, I guess. Uh, this is a, this, this may be on your board test. So a child is, uh, to a mother with SLE, uh, is born to mother and, uh, this little, little, little tyke develops a rash when exposed to a billy light. So what antibody is that? And so a smattering, so it's actually SSA or Rho. That's one you want to remember. Uh, this little, little one has uh, the neonatal lupus syndrome consists of either rash and arthritis, or in some, some little ones can actually develop uh, uh, high degrees of heart block as well. So in my patients, in our lupus patients who have SSA, they're often, uh, the child is often evaluated for the development of heart issues in utero and have the pediatric cardiologist standing by uh, when they're born because they may need to be paced. So the SSA in neonatal lupus is the one to remember. SSB occasionally as well, but the SSA in particular is what they'll ask you on your boards. Oops. Uh, here's another good one. This is also, they will ask you this on your boards because this is a very distinctive antibody. Okay, so 52 year old woman with a 10 year history of Raynaud's phenomena comes in for increasing problems with their hands as well as difficulty swallowing. She also has noted small red dots on her face and hands appearing over the last six months. Now, those are pretty impressive, aren't they? In exam, she has an attack of Raynaud's and has multiple red uh, lesions on face hands and even tongue. So we'll also ask uh, the question of the group. You can answer by chat. What are the names of these red dots? And you get extra credit for actually being able to spell it right. Yes, excellent. So 55% said centromere. Uh, this, uh, this is a classic case of limited scleroderma. It used to be called Crest syndrome, and these patients are 95% centromere positive. So what are the name of those little red dots? Aha, Tony says telendictasia and spelled it correctly. Uh, oh, they spelled it correctly. Well, I'm impressed. I can't spell it correctly uh, even now <laughs> after 40 years as a rheumatologist. Um, and the other question is, do they blanch or non-blanch when you push on them? Answer is, they blanch. Blanch very nicely. We're 50-50 on that one. So here's some antibodies you need to know about. Uh, the ANA screen. So uh, here the University of Washington, uh, the ANA lab is great, run by Mark Winner. He, he does it right. Uh, there are different patterns that often relate to the, the kinds of antibodies that are present in what's called the ENA panel or extractable nuclear antigen panel. So we do an ANA screen first. It's done by IFA. Usually it's got to be, well, it's got to be over 1 to 80. I don't get too excited until it's 1 to 160 and tighter. Uh, but, but by definition, over 1 to 80. Uh, or equal to or greater than 1 to 80 is considered significant. Um, we've talked about centromere. Nucleolar also is one typical of um, scleroderma. Diffuse more is diffuse scleroderma. Homogeneous is often lupus, speckled, can be Sjogren's or a variety of other diseases. So double-stranded DNA is fairly specific for lupus. And the other important thing you need to know about is it goes up and down with the disease activity. So we follow that uh, in patients who have this antibody to see where it is and how the patient it may actually precede the onset of a, of a, um, of a flare. It also pretends more serious disease like renal disease. SSA row uh, depends on if you went to a row or, or an SSA school uh, for medical school, what you call it. SLE and Sjogren's syndrome, uh, often seen with uh, rash, polyarthritis, 
Um, also, in neonatal lupus, as we've mentioned, SSB long is pretty off, pr mostly seen in Sjogren's syndrome, also rarely in neonatal lupus syndrome. Smith, this is not SM, this is not smooth muscle, this is Smith, named after Miss Smith, who has a patient actually, University of Washington. Uh, seen in SLE and as part of the criteria, um, rarely SLE, uh, I'm not sure why that, I, I made a mistake there. No, it is seen in SLE. I mean, it's rare, but it is seen uh, typically in SLE only. Uh, can be associated with renal disease and ILD. RMP, SMRMP, uh, SLE, or if it's SMRMP alone, it can be seen in a disease called mixed connective tissue disease, which is a scleroderma-like disease. And there are the, the diseases, disease manifestations, uh, centromere, We've talked about that. I think Crest SCL70, also known as topoisomerase 1, um, is seen in scleroderma and predicts lung disease. A polymerase 3, also diffuse scleroderma, predicts skin disease and renal crisis. Okay. All right. So this is, we'll do some profiles and we'll see. Put your answers in the, I don't think this is, is a poll. So put your answers in the chat, okay? So the first patient has an ANA that's 1 to 640 speckled. SSA, SSB are both positive. Double strand in DNA, SM, RMP are negative, And rheumatoid factor is positive. This is a classic profile for, anybody know the answer to this? Put it in the chat. And we'll see what people come up with. No takers. Got some answers? No takers. No takers? Oh, no, with that one. Sjogren's, Sjogren's, Sjogren's. Yeah, Sjogren's. awesome. Yeah, this is this is a classic <laughs> profile for Sjogren's, okay? Um, doesn't get more classic than that. You don't need a lip. I, I don't do many lip biopsies anyway, because it usually is hard to interpret and gives, gives the patient paresthesia in the lip forever. But if you have this pattern, there's not much else that does it besides Sjogren's. Okay, this next one, patient two. One of three twenty homogeneous SSA positive, double strand DNA positive, RMP positive. What is what do you think this is associated with? We have a few folks saying SLE. Yeah, it's SLE. Great. Okay, this is something you're going to see not uncommonly in in your clinical practice. One thing I always try to emphasize and I always ask myself is, do I really want to check this ANA? How many people have, you know, we all seen who've been called lupus, who have a, who have fibromyalgia and a isolated ANA. So this is what this is, is an positive isolated ANA. Uh, there are no other autoantibodies. She has no, this person has no other features that could be ascribed to inflammatory disease. Again, may have fibromyalgia. How about patient number four? Would you get too excited about that one? So if anybody gets excited, uh, say yes in the chat. I get excited about an ANA of one to 40. I'm seeing only nose. <laughs> so yeah, this is a, I wouldn't worry about this one at all. I, I will point out that occasionally you can get isolated SSAs alone, and sometimes those are important, and sometimes those are not. So depends on the clinical symptoms. With the ANA big and negative, you know, the SSA positive, ANA uh, screen negative. All right, got another another situation here. Twenty five year old patient has widespread pain and fatigue. Exam is unremarkable except for widespread discomfort in muscles and joints. Um, she has a positive ANA and what's called a dense, fine, speckled pattern with a negative multiplex panel. A few days later, the diffuse, fine, speckled 70 antibody turns positive at 68. What's your next move? This is actually a relatively recent addition to our armamentarium. I think probably Jenna has more experience with this than I do. Jenna, if you have any comments about it, please. Uh, 2020 speak we started? What's that? Regular? I think 2020 we started. Yeah, so I, I don't, I haven't used this much, but I know it's now available. And uh, anybody, uh, what's the, what, the, what does the poll say here? Oops. 
Um, yeah, the answer actually is D. So, and Jenner's included some very nice slides. Um, the diffuse fine speckled antibody, uh, DFS70, if positive, is reassuring. So there's no known associated autoimmune disease associated with that antibody. Now the patient's ANA, ANA is positive for that antibody or caused by that antibody, you can reassure the patient that it's equivalent to a negative ANA, okay? Uh, and what do you order, John? Is that just come up on the, uh, or do you have to order something special? So right now it's either the um, ANA differentiator panel or there's one okay. called the, the ANA um, concert comprehensive panel plus. <laughs> um, so I wish this was just the standard for all of our, all of our ANAs, because it's, it's a yeah. really nice, nice test. And they won't run it unless the multiplex is completely negative because yeah. you can see these antibodies in association with other rheumatic disease, but it's when it's present in the absence of other, other antibodies on the multiplex panel, then it has a very good prognosis. Well, this might be useful if somebody comes to you with a positive ANA and they think they've got lupus and you don't think they do. Uh, and this comes up positive, you can reassure them that uh, they don't have lupus. Uh, although sometimes I, I do have to point out, uh, you can learn from my mistakes. I had a patient one time who came to me with a you know, 15, 20 year history of lupus and went through all the antibodies and sure ANA was positive by itself. And she had fibromyalgia. And I said, I don't think you ever had lupus. And she was so angry with me. Uh, because I took away a diagnosis that she had lived with, uh, you know, for 15, 15 years. So now I tell the patients, because I wasn't there when the diagnosis was made anyway, I say, you're one of the luckiest people in the world. Your lupus is now in remission. Uh, and that goes over much better than saying you probably never had it. So just That's a just, very good rule to live yeah. by. <laughs> but I, I, I've made mistakes that way before. Um, 20 year, this is the next case, 20 year old woman was referred for room clinic for a positive ANA, anti-double strand in DNA, anti-SM, polyarthralgias, facial rash, bare the nasal labial folds, which is a classic presentation of acute cutaneous lupus. You order additional lab tests, which medication has survival benefit in her condition and should be started, um, you probably know it's one of the one of the ones we love in rheumatology. Uh, this one not have a poll. Uh, I'm not sure if there's I, a poll, but anybody have uh, an idea just in the chat? Lots of bees coming. Lots up. of bees. <laughs> Lots of bees. Yes. So yeah, we love hydroxychloroquine. It, uh, uh, it actually comes, uh, it's a derivative of quinine, it comes from the cinchona tree in Peru. Hydroxychloroquine was developed as an uh, antimalarial after the World War II, and was started to use in the 1960s for rheumatoid arthritis and then for lupus, and it's an amazing medication. So these are the classification criteria for lupus. A classification criteria, as you probably know, are not diagnostic criteria. These criteria are used for clinical studies so that they can classify people and put them into a, a, a group. Uh, they are helpful to think about, though. And everybody, the rheumatology, for some reason, they love these points nowadays. Every, every criteria, classification criteria, is based on points. So it does give you the, the, the basic features of lupus, the positive ANA, constitutional symptoms, cutaneous symptoms, arthritis, neurologic, uh, serositis, hematologic, renal, phospholipid antibody positivity, low complements, and the specific antibodies that we've talked about. So useful to think about, but um, uh, I find sometimes find the old fashioned one, and I'm an old guy, soap brain MD as a way as also thinking about uh, sort of the manifestations of systemic lupus erythematosus. Now, even though I remember that nomogram, I was thinking in my mind, uh, do, I, do I get all the manifestations right? So the, the point is that systemic lupus can be a multi-system disease. 
and uh, often have a positive ANA, other antibodies, and then one or more clinical manifestation as well. You can actually have, based on the clinical criteria, on, on the classification criteria, if you just had a positive ANA and uh, uh, diffuse proliferative fibrillary nephritis on biopsy, you have lupus, even though you have no other manifestations. So discoid lupus, uh, they'll love to ask you this question on your board test. So the vast majority of people who have discoid, and Jenna sees a lot of these patients now since she works in the Durham Room Clinic, the vast majority of discoid patients do not have systemic disease, okay? You can have systemic disease and discoid, but again, dermatologists take care of the majority of people with discoid lesions. It can be, it can be an atro, it, it is an atrophine, it can be a very disfiguring kind of rash. Acute cutaneous lupus doesn't make any changes to your skin, whereas the discoid does. Um, it loves the face, it loves the scalp, and um, and here's a patient on on below there who has a fairly scarring uh, um, discoid lesions. Now, some people with a discoid can get some arthralgias, some myalgias, and not actually have systemic disease. So. And all discoid patients, I suspect, and Jenna can corroborate this, do get an ANA panel looking for the presence of discoid disease being the first manifestation of your systemic disease. Some more cutaneous manifestations. Here's a male with that uh, classic acute cutaneous lupus. Here's a little interesting. Let's see if anybody knows this. Uh, there is a condition that males get that predisposes them to developing lupus. Anybody know what it might be? One of those, uh, I'll, I'll show you in a second. Here's uh, some lupus toes, the little vasculitic lesions on the ends of the toes. This is a photosensitive uh, rash in somebody um, who was out in the sun. You get this non-scarring alopecia, which is very common in uh, lupus as well. And that comes back as opposed to my kind of hair loss, which it doesn't. And then here's the classic, uh, it's called Jacquard arthropathy. Uh, these patients can look just like rheumatoid arthritis with the swan neck deformities, et cetera. But when they make a fist or put their hands flat, it all goes away because it's inflammation around the joints that affects the uh, supporting structures. So anybody get the, uh, anybody make a guess at uh, a male condition that can predispose you to lupus? No takers. No takers? Mm -hmm. Kleinfelter syndrome, because they have two X's, uh, which increases the risk of developing lupus in the male. Males often have some of the worst disease as well. That would be a great board question, wouldn't it? Kleinfelter syndrome and lupus in a male. So uh, lupus nephritis is one of the things that gets our patients into big trouble. And it's typically type four, diffuse polarif. That's why I put it in uh, uh, italics. Um, remember, this can also be problematic and it can last forever, but uh, and it often la ends in the uh, development of chronic renal disease and end-stage renal disease. So when they do biopsies, they actually give you what's called an activity versus a chronicity score. So how active is it and how much chronic change is there? Uh, so that's helpful as you think about therapy for some of these patients. Um, we use mycophenolate for these patients uh, as well as cyclophosphamide. More mycophenolate now than we used to. This is also uh, vocal sporin, which has now been approved. It's a new calcium urine inhibitor. Um, the lumamab has been used. So there's a lot of different therapies we had we have now that we didn't have a few years ago for lupus nephritis. Um, NSAIDs can be used for arthritis, uh, low-dose prednisone, hydroxychloroquine is great for, uh, for this manifestation as well. Uh, methotrexate can also be used in some patients for serositis, uh, prednisone, hydroxychloroquine, and mycophenolate, depending on how severe it is. Renal disease, uh, we often use uh, you know, cyclophosphamide or mycophenolate. Uh, I think most of us are now using mycophenolate just because uh, less likely to put a young woman into um, uh, uh, non-childbearing status because that doesn't affect the, uh, the, uh, uh, the eggs permanently like cyclophosphamide can. Um, 
Tacrolimus belumumab of interest. My colleagues, our colleagues in nephrology often use hydroxychloroquine carin as well because it tends to cause, it tends to protect the, the, the kidneys from fibrosis. Um, rash, uh, lots of options. CNS lupus tend to be more aggressive with IV solumedrol, uh, mycophenolate, cyclophosphamide. Um, again, the point is that anybody who can tolerate hydroxychloroquine should probably be on it because it does have a survival benefit. It actually lowers the, um, uh, the LDL and raises your HDL. So I should be on that. It can also decrease your risk of heart disease and also decreases the risk of cancer. So in lupus, we always worry about infection. We worry about heart disease. We worry about osteoporosis and in addition to the other stuff as well. How are we doing on time? What time are we going to stop, John? Well, we're scheduled to go until 1130. So we uh, probably need to um, stop pretty soon. Yep. Okay. Let me just go over a few complications and I'll, we'll have to have you go over it. Are the, is this handout available to uh, our amazing residents? Uh, they can go through as well. It will be. Okay. So if you have any questions about what we didn't talk about, uh, please feel free to, uh, to reach out to Jenna or myself. And sorry, we didn't get to everything. Um, uh, and especially I, I've been working with Doug Powell on the, medicine board review course since 1990 and doug always has me put those puts in those things that are the common uh, the common section at the end of this discussion go through those in particular so always worried about infections we talked about and one of the major well one of the causes of death in our lupus patients is due to immunosuppression and it's opportunistic infections osteonecrosis if you have 20 milligrams prednisone or more for more than three weeks um, you are at risk for osteonecrosis. Uh, so, uh, anybody know what the face looks like in somebody who is at risk for osteoporosis? I mean, for osteonecrosis. Go ahead and put that in the chat. Worry about CAD and anybody with a chronic inflammatory disease. They're at increased risk of uh, CAD, osteoporosis for reasons of steroids and, and disuse of joints, and ovarian failure from cyclophosphamide. So what is the finding that would put somebody at risk for osteonecrosis? We got it? No takers. It's uh, cushionoid facies. So if the fat cells in your face get big, the fat cells in the end of your long bones get big as well and increases the interosseous pressure. And when you walk on those uh, pressurized bones, there's no place else for the pressure to go except to push on your blood vessels, your uh, your Arterial inflow is interrupted and your bone dies. And that's not a good thing. Um, okay, I think we're going to have to stop there since it's 1130. And uh, we won't get the vasculitis or scleroderma, I apologize. But do look at the presentation. There's, there's some fairly classic uh, features that you'll need to know about, especially don't look at, at scleroderma renal crisis. That will be on your boards. And don't forget that calcium, not calcium blockers, that ACE inhibitors are disease modifying for that process. Okay. So scleroderma renal crisis, ACE inhibitors will be on your boards. The All right. So thank you for. Crisis. Yeah. The scleroderma renal crisis has been on just about every boards that I've heard about. And so it, it definitely does show up. And I'll share um, when we do share these out, I believe, Jen, if I'm correct, the end has. Uh, some rapid fire tips frequently seen on the boards. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we do. Sorry, guys, we didn't get to those. We had so much we wanted to talk about. <laughs> Too much. Yeah, the things at the end are things like uh, uh, carpal tunnels, Achilles. And yeah, carpal tunnel, Achilles tendonitis. Uh, um, those if, are if you don't yeah. mind, if you can, can just maybe you can just uh, flip to that page so that people know what to look for as they scan through. It's called Stuff They Left the Axe on Boards. There's uh, uh, scaphoid osteonecrosis, uh, scaphoid fracture. Uh, what's this one? Oh, she has decrovenge tenosynovitis. Uh, 
oh, this is patellofemoral disease. There's some lateralization of the patella, condomalacia patella. Uh, oh, this is a, a Baker cyst. And this often shows up on the boards too. Here's a room, one of my rheumatoid patients with a big Baker cyst. What they'll often ask you is the Baker cyst can rupture. And this bottom picture here shows you what's called um, a rupture in severe pain in the calf. And you get this bleeding uh, down around the malleolus. It's called uh, uh, pseudo uh, DVT. Uh, that can also be on the boards from a Baker cyst. Uh, and here's a case of a Morton's neuroma that you need to go know about. And plantar fasciitis, carpal tunnel syndrome, Achilles tendinopathy. Yeah. So just, oh, anybody know what the, this, uh, this one last question. So here's somebody squeezing the calf of somebody uh, and looking for integrity of the Achilles tendon. In fact, I did, I, when I was a resident, I worked uh, urgent care. This came in handy for me one time. And it's the name of a famous rheumatologist. Well, actually, actually not, actually it's not quite similar, but it's similar to a famous rheumatologist. <laughs> this is called a Thompson test. So you squeeze the, uh, the calf and the foot should uh, plantar flex if the Achilles is intact, okay? And hopefully you'll find that useful sometime. And I think that's it. I think we'll, we'll end there. So yeah, go through those common things on the boards because they love to ask those things. And it's and also you'll find it useful for your for your careers as well. Do, do, All right. Do so any questions, to... uh, please reach out to us. Okay. Do, do, do you mind going to the next slide? It has our um, evaluation links on it. Oh, uh, my evaluation link on it. <laughs> yeah, I, don't, I don't know how to do that. You have, <laughs> have to show me how to do that. Yeah, if you guys don't mind filling in an evaluation, that's really helpful. I'm re I'm emeritus faculty, so whatever you say about me won't hurt me. So <laughs> now it comes out. Thank um, you guys th so much for your engagement in the in the talk. So so great having everybody so engaged in such a lively chat. I love that. Yeah, I haven't. Lots. I I have to say I haven't had a Zoom session with with so much of uh, activity from everybody. So I really appreciate that. Yeah, lots of appreciation being expressed for uh, for the wonderful information that you shared. All right, well, have a good rest of your day. Enjoy your afternoon clinics. Thank you, guys. Thanks.